darkness, the breeding ground of horror, where fiends not of this earth appear. Moments of terror, and how we relish them. A haunted mansion where actors, papier-mâché, and paint speak a language we know well, the language of horror. We learned it from superstitions, tales, comic books. But most of all, we learned it in those other halls of darkness. The movie theaters of yesteryear. Desperate heroes, beautiful heroines, villains, monsters. Always they were there to provide us with our beloved moments of terror. Grotesque images torn out of our own dark, our own earliest nightmares. Try as we may, we are never quite able to leave them behind. And that's the horror of it all. It seems we are forever drawn toward what we fear. Young or old, we are tempted to go inside the darkness, to come out on another side, a temptation for which we have always been willing to pay. We grow up with a certain hunger, not only for the bright things in life, but for things that are fearful. And, and terrifying. The filmmaker puts something on the screen and each individual member of the audience adds something unto themselves to complete the process. You know, if you wonder why the continual preoccupation with horror in motion pictures, there's a reason. People love to be scared. The great horror movies of bygone days are like extensions of nightmares, past and present. A secret word in the 1920 film, The Golem, gives magic power to a sage. So taken was Paul Wegener with the legend of an inanimate figure who becomes a champion against oppression that he three times turned it into film. Wegener's own impressive size enabled him to play the giant clay statue brought to life. The golem set a pattern, defying the laws of God and man, even with good intentions, inevitably led to disaster. We learned, too, that beautiful women would never be safe with monsters. Also, in horror films, leading men are invariably ineffectual against monsters. In The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, also produced in Germany in 1920, horror took on a uniquely subjective cast. A sinister figure, Caligari reveals his strange powers over a sleepwalker. Seeking to project the world of a psychotic, this film uses painted flats to create a threatening and surreal environment as Cesare, the somnambulist, goes forth to commit the murders commanded by his master. This scene was so unsettling that it helped make The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari one of the most discussed films of the 20s an abiding dread that would be aroused repeatedly in horror films of the future, being attacked when we are most vulnerable, while we sleep. The cabinet of Dr. Caligari catapulted Conrad Veidt 
to world attention, and it bore home the axiom horror films would repeat. Our monsters were invariably very human and vulnerable to beauty. One of horror's most reliable staples, guaranteed to produce dread in any audience, the story of the vampire. In 1922, moviegoers were mesmerized by the German-made Nosferatu, an early working of the Bram Stoker novel, Dracula. This was no simple creature made from clay, no sleeping figure locked in a trance. This was the undead, a monster who retreated by day to his coffin, but who roamed by night to feed on human blood. In director Fritz Lang's Metropolis, a fantasy and horror film, also from Germany, the heroine is trapped in the very world of the dead, the dark catacombs of a city in a far distant future. As always, the heroine's cries bring no rescue. Her villainous pursuer, the arch-heavy of the horror film, the mad scientist. A scene that would echo and re-echo in horror films to come. The laboratory where a scientist dares imitate God as he transfers the very soul of a human being to give life to his robot creation. European horror films emphasized the supernatural. But in the United States, horror had a more realistic base. In 1920, a prohibition conscious audience readily accepted that in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, even a single drink could lead to terrible consequences. John Barrymore's performance made that possibility chillingly believable. He understood Stevenson's play. Stevenson mentioned that he was the personification of evil, but it was the evil of his expression, and it was not achieved by Barrymore with makeup. You know, the, the leading men are not remembered by the public. It's the heaviest that are remembered, because they're the characters in plays and in motion pictures who are the active ones. The leading men are acted upon, but the heavies, the villains, are the ones who do things. Uh, that's why the great actors of, oh, ever since Betterton have preferred to play the heavies. Lou Telligan was a leading man to Sally Bernhardt for many years, and he came to the States, and uh, I got to know him because we were both sculptors. He was an extremely handsome man with a magnificent physique, walked like a panther, had a cold gray eye that you could see a mile away. And he once said to me, I love my men of sin. Lon Chaney, one of the great actors of silent films, gave his men of sin a thousand faces, each more fear-inspiring than the next. Chaney's pride was that he not only performed his own stunts, he also created and applied his often spectacular makeup. One of his greatest films, made in 1925, The Phantom of the Opera. The important element is that much of it takes place in the semi-darkness of catacombs. 
In a way, the Paris Opera House is a symbol of the unconscious mind in which dwells monstrous desire. And this struck a resonant chord in many of the masculine members of the audience. Cheney's performance, because he spent much of the time wearing a mask, was a matter of ballet. He was a master, a consummate master of pantomime. Phantom of the Opera didn't have any overt supernatural implications, but we had a man who slept in a coffin, who lived in catacombs five levels below the Paris Opera House, and who masked himself to disguise a hideous face. And in a way, he pressed the buttons of an audience that at that time was very unaware of the sexual symbolism involved. But it registered nonetheless, because in effect, the character of Cheney is portrayed in the Phantom of the Opera was that of a man who is ashamed or afraid of his own sexuality, who conceals his monstrous desire, as it was termed in those days, under a mask. When it is revealed, the heroine recoils in fright from a kindly, gentle man who is now revealed as a hideous being. The unique quality of the silent film in America was that it did not deal with supernatural topics per se. Actually, evil was personified by the ugly and the deformed, as in the case of Lon Chaney and the other actors. And it took place usually in an atmosphere of darkness. We knew, of course, that handsome people were almost invariably good and that uh, deformed, elderly, unfortunate people were bad. This we had learned in our fairy tales as children. Now we were seeing those fairy tales in darkness up there on the screen, without benefit of Freudian psychology, without benefit of special effects. The important thing is we believed what we saw, and it frightened the living blazes out of us. A 1927 American film that did frighten the blazes out of audiences, The Cat and the Canary. The dark, haunted mansion where terror could lurk in every corner became part of the growing language of horror. It was where anything could happen, and often did. Again, the leading man proved undependable. But at least in this film, he provided comic relief. A classic moment of horror and the source of countless nightmares. In 1931, Svengali, starring John Barrymore, was released. Sound had arrived, increasing immeasurably the ways films could influence the emotions of audiences. Svengali's true impact came from the unsettling demonstration of mind control from afar. Here was no mad scientist intent on creating life. This villain is able to take a life over. 
gentlemen, it uh, might be as well to remember there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. These mysteries became a challenge for a new generation of filmmakers. Mr. Zucker, the head of Paramount, called me up and asked me if I would like to do a film of the famous Stevenson story, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I saw the story uh, as a conflict between, not between good and evil, as it used to be done before, where uh, um, Jekyll becomes an evil person, a monster. Uh, but I saw the story more as a conflict between the high aspiration of every human being and his lower, baser instincts. And that the whole idea was to have a young man, very handsome, whose whole uh, intention is to free himself from all the evil impulses, all the animal impulses, really, not evil, animal. And the idea with Frederick March was <clears throat> that he, when he becomes Hyde, he does not become a monster, but he becomes our common ancestor, the Neanderthal man. And Frederick March gave a beautiful performance and wound up by winning the, the Academy Award. <laughs> The same year, 1931, one of the films designed to meet a public appetite for movies that scared was The Bat Whispers. There was the reliable old mansion at night. This time the menace casting shadows, a bat in human form, shades of terror to come. Outside, the reliable thunderstorm. And inside, a heroine who naturally insists on going where no one in her right mind would even dream of going, through the ever-present secret door. One essential sound of the horror film, the scream of the terrorized heroine, was yet to be heard. In the tradition of the mystery horror film, the villain is eventually unmasked. Get away this time. You think you've got me, eh? Well, let me tell you this. There never was a jail built strong enough to hold the bat. And after I've paid my respects to your cheap lockup, I shall return at night. The bat always flies at night. And always in a straight line. The bat enacted by Chester Morris, never did manage to return. But in the same year, another kind of bat descended on the movie-going public with the release of Dracula. Bats, wolves, and vampires became honorary members in horrordom's Hall of Fame, as did Dracula's star, Bela Lugosi. After this one production, the supernatural would become an enduring element of the American horror film. Also in 1931, another movie was destined to become a classic, creating a new horror star, Boris Karloff. The film was Frankenstein, based on the early 19th century novel by Mary Shelley. 
Yet again, a scientist dares attempt to create a life. The result? A monster who would eventually turn on his creator. Never before, and perhaps never again, would the elements for producing terror in an audience seem so perfectly fused. It's very interesting to compare these two films that were made almost at the same time in the early 30s, uh, in that <clears throat> they both dealt with the theme of death. Dracula with an undead creature brought back to life, living off of the blood of the living, and the Frankenstein monster, a creature made from parts of dead bodies and perhaps doubly terrifying for that reason. When I was much younger, I knew the late James Whale, and uh, he told me a fascinating anecdote about the first sneak preview of Frankenstein, which was held in Santa Barbara. While he was sleeping in the middle of the night, he was awakened with a phone call, and a voice came on the line saying, are you the director of that film that was previewed tonight? And he said, yes. And the voice said, well, I can't sleep, and I'll be damned if I'll let you sleep. And James uh, found this uh, story to be very amusing. And it was a characteristic of his horror films, particularly, that they were always very much leavened with humor because uh, he felt, and I think rightly so, from a dramatic point of view and from the audience point of view, that it was very important to relieve the, the, the tension that was built in a horror film with humor along the way. There was humor in White Zombie, a blend of horror and gothic romance made in 1932. Not all of it intentional. However, in this film, Another method used to build tension was an especially effective music track. One year after Dracula, White Zombie clearly showed the influence of the earlier film. Once again, Bela Lugosi played the arch villain, the harbinger of doom. Who are you? And what are they? For you, my friend, they are the angels of death. Not surprisingly, the leading man was inadequate. The heroine, helpless. It was uh, 1932, and James Whale had just finished Frankenstein, which was an enormous success, with Boris Karloff, who was the star of The Old Dark House 2. We had Charles Lawton in his first American film. We had Raymond Massey. We had Melvin Douglas. And I was very impressed. Boris was as charming and gentle a person off screen as he was horrendous and threatening on screen. There was a great deal of uh, thunder going and lightning and rain coming in and cobwebs and doors creaking. As a leading lady, it was my job to be very, very frightened. So Mr. Whale put me into a pale silk velvet bias cut evening dress, very décolleté. And I asked him why, and he said, because when Boris is chasing you through the corridors, I want you to be like a flame going through the house and be very threatened. And that was my role, to be very threatened, very frightened, and to scream a lot. You know, actually, I think that 
putting me in pale pink silk velvet uh, added to the feeling of fragility and uh, uh, and help uh, helplessness that actresses needed in in horror films because if the beautiful young actress or lady is not threatened there's there's no horror the horror film playing at the neighborhood movie house became like a visit of dearly valued old friends how audiences loved those actors they had learned to hate high on their special enemy list was lionel atwell his most frequent victim fay ray a 1933 film, The Vampire Bat. You. You're the one. What mad thing are you doing? Mad? The one who has solved the secret of life to be considered mad? Life. Created in the laboratory. No mere crystalline growth, but tissue. Living, growing tissue. Life that moves, pulsates, and demands food for its continued growth. <laughs> you shudder in horror. So did I the first time. No one expressed the lunatic logic of the mad scientist better than Lionel Atwill. I have lifted the veil. I have created life. Wrested the secret of life from life. Now you stand for the lives of those who have gone before. I have created life. Fay Ray was every fan's ideal of a beautiful, threatened heroine. For tonight, Carl's name will be added to yours. And all of those whom this achievement will immortalize. This monster is one whom we, as members of the audience, can recognize through the makeup as having some of the qualities that are buried within ourselves. All of us got some kind of vicarious pleasure, I'm sure, out of watching King Kong go on a rampage and tear down the very symbols of New York City that represented wealth and power and prestige, which most of us were denied because most of us were very poor during the Depression. We paid a dime or 15 cents or 25 cents tops to see King Kong and the other monsters. Those of us who were adolescents got the same kind of satisfaction and gratification out of watching Frankenstein's monster because he, in a way, was a very symbol of adolescence. Lumbering, inarticulate, ugly, unwanted in a society where uh, age was uh, deemed superior to youth. It's hard to believe that it's turned around, but it has. By the end of the 30s, the old monsters were beginning to lose their impact. We now found humor in the master of horror himself, Bela Lugosi. We knew the truth, even if the Ritz brothers didn't. The gorilla had a zipper down his back. Other films followed. They revealed that the old sinister characters and situations had been made laughable by the real horror of a very real war. Vampires and mad scientists continued to populate B-movies in the 40s, but increasingly, they had become old hat. I work in the Louvre. I was almost insane with joy. To attract additional and more sophisticated audiences, a new kind of horror film began to appear. It was in 1944 that Bluebeard was released. Searching everywhere. At last, I traced her through the doctor I'd called in for her. He gave me her address. I went there. Outside her door, I heard laughter. But what laughter? Then, it was then I really saw her. She invited me in. But she wasn't the same Jenny. This was the real Jeanette, a low, coarse, loathsome creature. She offered me money. I suppose she thought she could repay me with money. Suddenly, the sight of that Jeanette did something to me, something indescribably infuriating. I thought they would stop her defiling the image I created of her. 
stop it degrading my work. Bluebeard hangs in my memory, not only because I was the star of it, but because it had a depth of characterization, which in that period in Hollywood was not often seen on the screen. Because when they became Jeanette, I could take out my fury on them. I couldn't kill Wood. In the early days of Hollywood, uh, pictures were in black and white. Black and white in more than one way, not only in the in the character of the film of the film material, but in the in the plot lines. Everything was either black or white. There were no greys. The villains were just steeped in villainy, and the heroes were just too good to be true. Uh, Hollywood grew, and now we have uh, human characters on the screen that have shades of, of uh, evil and shades of good, uh, and there are greys. Uh, it took a while for Hollywood to learn this. The titles of the films produced by Val Luton in the early 40s seemed to promise a traditional form of horror. But instead of tales of man-made monsters, vampires and werewolves, Luton's films explored the quality of fear itself, the unseen, the dark, the superstitions of the ages, the hidden recesses of the human psyche. These were his subjects. The power of his films derived from what they implied rather than what they showed. A monster in a Luton film could otherwise be quite an engaging fellow. A scene from The Body Snatcher, directed by Robert Wise with Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. The A-bomb had fallen. Audiences, conditioned by years of movies, knew the consequences of science unleashed. Here was the spawn, monsters wreaking havoc. From Japan came horror films featuring Godzilla, raging, huge, and pitiless, not to be distracted by any fey ray. Released from a deep freeze by atomic blasts, he was intent only on his deadly mission. And from a menacing outer space came the implacable Ghidra. The 50s were a time of suspicion. As one movie solemnly warned, watch the skies. There were enemies out there. There were enemies everywhere. Mutants resulting from nuclear radiation out to kill. Weird monsters from other planets out to destroy. Horror and science fiction merged in films that reflected the daily headlines warning of conspiracies within and imminent attack from without. But monsters were not always easily recognized. In the 1956 Invasion of the Body Snatchers, they took on the familiar forms of your next door neighbor. At the same time, the monsters in some horror films were becoming more personally connected with an important new audience. One of the first and most successful of these films, I Was a Teenage Werewolf, starring Michael Landon in his first feature film. When I first started making horror films, it was because I made a film called Crime of Passion starring Barbara Stanwyck, Sterling Hayden, Raymond Berg. We got great reviews. And the picture opened up and died. And I want to know what happened. So I toured the country. I got out of Hollywood. And I saw what happened and what was happening. And that was the, was the teenagers that were buying the records. It was the teenagers that were leaving the house, getting away from that TV box in the living room. The teenagers wanted to get away from the home. They wanted to get away from their parents. And they went to the cinema. They went to the theater. And they had fun with the horror picture because in, a, in my horror films, whether it was I was a teenage werewolf, I was a teenage Frankenstein, Blood of Dracula, the teenager was, they were always against the culprit that was the adult. And that's what the kids felt. And that's why they really had a good time. And they had fun with my pictures. The lines of demarcation were gradually being drawn between those who wanted their horror straight and those who preferred it to be suggested. A film that brought the issue home the 1958 production, Curse of the Demon, directed by Jacques Tourneur and starring Dana Andrews. Yes. These are his tools. Well, you want your hat and coat, don't you, sir? My coat. 
Oh, yes, yes. That's very forgetful of me. Thank you very much. I... You passed them. You slipped them in my pocket. It's two minutes of ten. We had completed the picture over in England and had returned quite satisfied with the work we had done. And uh, much to our chagrin, when we saw the picture, uh, the uh, producer had uh, put into the picture a mechanical device which had been concocted by the special effects English people and made a real demon which you could see walking through the forest. <laughs> was a tremendous shock to all of us because the, the Oliver Onions uh, story had ended with the remark, maybe it would be better not to know. To know or not to know. In the 1960 Italian production distributed in the United States under the title Black Sunday, the director left no doubt Horror was to be known. It was to be seen, very graphic and up close. The law of the horror film from earliest days. The dead are never totally dead. the beginning of a cult, the beginning of a, a new era, a new era, a new beginning of horror pictures. Um, Hammer, I think, came out of the fact that perhaps on television, they couldn't show a lot of blood. They weren't allowed to show that. They weren't allowed to show a lot of sexuality. There was no nudity on television. So perhaps Hammer came out of that taboo. And so I think a new color came, blood came, and a new sexuality, a new sensuality. Of course, because there was nudity. But there was also a sensuality connected to the dark side. And uh, that's something I think that connected with people, the dark side. We all have it. I've never been offered the role of a sweet person. I think it has to do with the fact that perhaps they saw the dark side of me. And I do fit the traditional pictures of the dark woman, the evil lady. I think that's why moviegoers go to see these films. They want to get in touch with that evil side. In the United States, Films that dealt with the dark side received a significant boost from the work of producer-director Roger Corman. Despite limited budgets, he made a series of compelling horror films based on stories by Edgar Allan Poe. They frequently starred such well-known masters of the macabre as Boris Karloff, Basil Rathbone, Peter Laurie. The Poe films helped reaffirm Vincent Price as the reigning prince of films of the dark. The most lavish and striking of these films was Mask of the Red Death. I have tasted the beauties of terror.
the beating of a heart, the footstep of an assassin, destiny. I beg you, do not mourn for Juliana. We should celebrate. She has just married a friend of mine. Let the mass begin! You might hold a little bit longer on the shot of his going under the table and then trim a little bit of the beginning of this shot here. I'd like to hold... Horror stories have been popular throughout all of history. I think there's a reason for that. The experiencing of horror through a motion picture or a story is a cathartic experience. It's a way in which the person can work out and express certain problems within his unconscious mind. We all have had feelings of horror as a child. These whole feelings have generally been buried. They lay repressed or suppressed in the back of the mind. And when you go to see a horror film and you scream, and you scream with the audience, you are easing some of the pressure. Now, at the same time, when you do scream, you will very often smile afterwards smile or laugh because you know to a certain extent you've been had by the filmmaker. You know that he has manipulated the tools of his craft in order to get the right emotion from you. These are some of the new techniques we're working with here at New World. In our prosthetics department, we're capable of doing almost anything. I'm not an android. Oh. This guy's got a close-up tomorrow. And he... so... John Beekler is one of the best yes. men in the business, I think. He's the head of our department, and he's created the special effects, the prosthetics, for a number of our films. Push it over, back, back to the left a little bit. In each one of these things, what he's trying to do is to give the audience something to build upon from within themselves. The brace is slipping. Try to mime I'm not an android with this mouth. I am not an android. I am a human being. It'll work. But it's essential to remember that special effects are never an end unto themselves. Special effects are a means to lead the audience into a fuller understanding and appreciation of the film. The goal is not to dazzle the audience with the special effects, although it's nice if you can do that. The goal is to reach the unconscious of the audience and to let them experience, through special effects, emotions and visual sensations on film that cannot be achieved in any other way. When I was doing the Poe films years ago, we had to leave much to the audience's imagination, and I don't think that was necessarily bad. The audience should participate in the film-going process. The language of horror has been extended. Our most blood-curdling nightmares rendered a thousand times over. Special effects have brought spectacular new ways of instilling terror. And yet, graphic realism is not new, nor is the debate that it stirs. The, the tradition of the Grand Guignol theater, which goes back to the turn of the century and before in France, was always one of presenting gore on stage. I mean, showing it happen, people having their throats ripped open and, and having a hot burning iron placed on the side of their face or something like that, with, done with tremendous technical expertise. Uh, and this, this tradition, of course, has been carried over into the horror film. The essence of enjoying a horror film is in the fact that you, as a spectator, 
are totally safe. You are secure. What's happening on the screen is not going to happen to you. Some years ago, I wrote a novel called Psycho about a mass murder. And Alfred Hitchcock made it into a film very effectively without using overt violence, merely suggesting it on the screen. But times have certainly changed. In the last 20 years, we have nothing but explicit violence in the so-called spatter films today. The real horror today is not horror films, which are a lot of fun. Teenagers and adults love them because we never get rid of our fears of the dark and fears of the night. The real horror is on the streets today, in every city, in every town. It's on our television news. If you see a body lying in the street and you've seen it on film uh, as a child and as a, a young person and as a young adult and as a mature person, it's not a great shock, and it should be. In recent times, that I think that it has become uh, so excessive and then it becomes a kind of pornography of uh, blood for its own sake, and of course that does become distasteful. It's necessary to uh, call the halt somewhere along the line, I feel, and return to the prime virtues of the horror film, the wonder and the fantasy and terror that it evokes. You can hand somebody a glass of milk, and if the music is right and the setting is right, the audience will jump and scream in the theater. That, the very fact that you don't know is what makes it fearful and makes it mystifying and shocking and uh, can scare the devil out of you. Our enjoyment of terror derives mainly from movies. But like children at Halloween, we are forever tempted to get up close, to be surrounded by what we most fear. Fear? Why do people come in here to get scared? What do you do that's going to bring out that fear in the person? What you want to do is you want to put yourselves in the position of what seeing you're doing. You are Lizzie Borden. You killed your mother, Jack the Ripper. He killed all these women. Whether you're the Wolfman, whether you're Dracula, whether you're a butcher or a To scare, to, to be scared, we are able to take either role, for we have all, at one time or another, had to deal with our own dark. I was orphaned when I was three years old. My father died. And I was sent to an Episcopal orphanage in Peekskill, New York, run by the Episcopal Sisters of St. Mary. They were very sensible women. Lights went out when it was time to go to sleep, and they stayed out until the morning. Uh, so I never learned to be afraid of the dark. My mother told me that I used to have a Halloween skeleton made out of paper in my room, and she was very amused because I loved that skeleton. It represented my fears, but she said that every night before I went to sleep, I would take that and put it outside my room and close the door so that I didn't have to have it with me in the dark. I remember Mama saying every night, good night, children. My brother and I shared the same bedroom. Good night, children. I'll leave the light on in the hall. And I must have equated that with, um, Dark not being good for me. Dark and light, they exist together, they coexist, and they must, must be dealt into. The dark side must be. And suddenly we heard this scratchy noises above, behind the glass. My grandmother went and opened the curtain, and there pressed against the glass was this frightening face of this young woman with her nose flattened against the glass, her teeth scowling, and her nails going like this on the glass. Well, we're absolutely petrified with fear. I'll, I'll never forget that, how frightening that was. So my grandmother said, don't be afraid. And she opened the door, and I could see her as if it happened yesterday. She stood there, and she made this gesture to the girl, opened her embrace. And the girl, the insane girl, came right up to her, and she embraced her, and the girl put her head against my grandmother's shoulder. You see, she said, you must learn one thing, and that is that if you fill your heart with love, there'll be no room left in it for fear. Through the years, the attitude of fans of the old classic horror films has been one of love. 
what you see now on the walls is an approximation of my devotion to the horror films of the 30s. These particular frames always remind me of the old theaters where people could go in and lose themselves into another world where people can live for 500 years on human blood, where fantasy reigns supreme. These ghoulies and ghosties, creatures that go bump in the night, the things that make you as a child whistle past the graveyard, these flickering images of cinema, thanks to Karloff, Lugosi, Cheney, Fay Ray, and the clutches of King Kong, all the memories of our childhood, of the horror film, of vampires, these things are never going to die, because in the horror film, they are truly deathless, and so are we all. We have all passed this way before, shivered at these gargoyles and phantoms honed out of our common fears. And yet we go on in a perverse delight to confront what may lie ahead in the dark. In every horror film, there is a door, and behind that door lurks that which we fear the most. That which we fear in real life, something that lurks behind the closed door in our own mind. It's often the fear of death, the fear of pain. And yet that door must be opened. We must face, we must confront our own mortality, our own uh, feeling of inadequacy. And in the best horror films, that door is opened for us. We glimpse the horror, are able to confront it, and walk away with the feeling that from then on, we can live with the fear of death or the fear of suffering. We can understand it a little better, and in so doing, understand our own souls. We have all learned the language of horror. We have shared it, just as we share the nightmares of the child that remains within us all. Thank you.